a deep dynastic wound. <clears throat> My lecture in the last week of last term, focusing on William Empson's poem, Legal Fiction, published in 1928, emphasized the old-fashioned English notions of class, but disputed the argument, set up, you might say, for the sake of argument, that these archaic notions necessarily decided areas of sympathy or adherence in the peculiar business of composing poetry. Empson's poem, you may recall, established its field of discourse in the archaic but residually active legal fiction, quies ad solum, eus est usque ad celum et ad inferos, to whomsoever the soil belongs, that also is his, to the height of the heavens and to the depths of the earth. In the earliest days of flying machines, this fiction got at least one English landowner off a charge of murder. Subsequently, as mass air travel and international rocketry became commonplace, uh, it was found necessary to amend the fiction of aerial trespass to a mere fanciful shadow. Though when fracking gets underway in force here, as it will, I would expect some revived attempt to cite the matter of subterranean accounting and accountability, either for protest or profit. I described Empson's poem as a powerful, albeit technically imperfect, and powerfully moving poem about original sin, which to Empson, the militant atheist, is a clause in Christianity's vile takeover and moral makeover, but is nonetheless an ever-threatening agent in the manufacture of general mortal woe. The poem's rhetoric is a po-faced parody of Calvinist predestination polemic and Marxist class diatribe, both viewed as exhilaratingly frightful chop logic. I remarked that the question whether the brute fact of territorial ownership grants security of possession in all underlying substances was a matter of real familial import to a poet whose father happened to be a Yorkshire landowner, Empson, but was necessarily of remotest import to the 15, 16 year old son of a Worcestershire village bobby. So why the immediate sense of affinity that this son of a village bobby felt for this poem by a Yorkshire, by the son of a Yorkshire landowner? I remember making that point, I don't know how it was received. Um, my intention was to sing the praises of poetic structure, or more broadly, of imaginative structuring. So why bring my own juvenile self into the scenario at all? Well, first, because in all matters and questions to do with critical assessment, you have a duty to tell your audience where you are coming from. Critical objectivity entails an unending struggle to overcome subjectivism of which state or condition how refreshing and leaves a bad taste in the mouth are the essential idiom. Secondly, if you accept Wallace Stevens's dictum, the poem is the cry of its occasion 
part of the res itself and not about it. You are not, in simple consequence, acceding to that perennial piece of bad advice, write only about what you know. It is rather that you choose to make a vibrant ringing structure out of semantics and metrics, and through that to discover what it is that you know. If in imagination you fancy your own name, e.g. G.W. Hill, though a six, instead of William Empson's at the head or foot of legal fiction, you're not alone in your desire to give a shape to your as yet embryonic factum est. Neil Sedaka has recalled apropos 13 7 inch 45 RPM vinyl records that prior to his achieving celebrity, he would occasionally enter using Biro, did he say? Enter his own name on the central label of a disc that he especially admired. Christopher Logue, maker of the superb war music, an account of books one to four and 16 to 19 of Homer's Iliad, has observed of his own childhood and early adolescence, I have always envied precocious achievers like Pope, achievers note, not self-expressionists, achievers like Pope, and he said also, secretly I put my name, not Kipling's, at the end of my fair copy of Gunga Din. I insist that in the case of Siddhartha and Loeb, and doubtless of others too, the desire is not for self-expression, but for the achievement of the first essential self-defining structure, the prime objective correlative of self-being. Between the ages of 17 and 20, Dylan Thomas maintained a series of poetry notebooks, the drafts of which he drew upon for the remainder of his writing life. He died early, of course, age 39. I recall reading early critiques of his work, uh, critiques that I've not reread for 50 years. Studies which stress their own Freudian hypotheses as to the vade mecum of his adolescent genius. And I do agree that he had and has genius, albeit not the genius of young Rambo or Henri Gaudier. Uh, I would not say, however, that in reading these drafts, and these drafts have all been available in print since 1967, that in reading these drafts, the obligation to Freudian analysis uh, presents itself as ineluctable. When you read through them, um, you're struck more by a concern on his part for verbal pattern and structure I build a tower and I pull it down, as he writes in one place. And in another, I who am steady was once savage. I was savage, but now I am steady. Two complementary lines which conclude one of the early sketches. Or again, he says, moving, moving symmetrically in chaos. That's what he is interested in, moving symmetrically in chaos not in exhibiting the fascinating chaos of his own adolescent self. I would, I would guess the psychic motivation here 
the psychic desire less for expression than for structure to be not unlike that of the 12-year-old Alan Turing in a letter to his mother. He says in that 12-year-old letter, I always want to seem to make things, he means scientific discoveries or proofs, I always seem to want to make things from the thing that is commonest in nature and with the least waste of energy. I always seem to want to make things from the thing that is commonest in nature and with the least waste of energy. Least waste of energy here means with near perfect economy, not with minimal exertion. Now a 12 year old poet, provided she was blessed with a gift to rival Turing, she would need to be Emily Dickinson, might foresee that it was or would be in her power to make things with the least waste of energy from that which was commonest in nature, the detonating commonplaces of New England provincial polite society and the brutally pernickety habits of the local fauna. That there is a deep dynastic wound correlative to such achievement, it would not be possible to deny. And apposite citations are for the taking. Emerson's. The profound nature will have a savage rudeness. The delicate one will be shallow or the victim of sensibility, the victim of sensibility mark. The richly accomplished will have some capital absurdity. And so every piece has a crack. Tis strange. But this masterpiece is a result of such an extreme delicacy that the most unobserved flaw in the boy will neutralize the most aspiring genius and spoil the work. Emerson. Or John Henry Newman. Did I see a boy of good make and mind with the tokens on him of a refined nature cast upon the world without provision, unable to say whence he came, his birthplace or his family connections, I should conclude that there was some mystery connected with his history, and that he was one of whom, from one cause or other, his parents were ashamed. Thus only should I be able to account for the contrast between the promise and the condition of his being. And so I argue about the world. If there be a God, since there is a God, the human race is implicated in some terrible Aboriginal calamity. Now, read as the aftermath of my most recent allusion to the 15 or 16 year old son of a village Bobby, such passages may be supposed as redirected towards some notion of autobiographical poignancy. But this was not my intention. Adherents and opponents of Judeo-Christian theology will draw the inevitable but not totally inescapable conclusion that the phrase a deep dynastic wound is someone's mnemonic code for the doctrine of original sin and that I propose to make the theme the main burden of this present lecture.
Now, if Emerson accepted that doctrine, and it would be very difficult for a 19th century New Englander not to, at least as a cultural premise, it must be said that he modulated it in terms such as alienated majesty, that Whitman, who rejected the doctrine, found aborigine inspirational. In wordcraft, permit me the fancy term, in wordcraft, the doctrine establishes itself wordily. Now, I have to say that I think Newman's paragraph is grotesque, not for what it says, but through verbal mishearing. I should conclude that there was some mystery connected with his history. By what dire oversight did he allow this absurd internal rhyme to stand in final proof, to mar with its ludicrous jingle a passage that he clearly designed to carry his message of poignant but fatal judgment, how he weighs his clauses for an effect of joint finality, at once grammatical and juridical. And so I argue about the world, colon, dash, if italicized, there be a God, comma, since italicized, there is a God, comma, the human race is implicated in some terrible aboriginal calamity, period. This is a paragraph which will establish itself over the following century and a half. Newman's Apologia was first published in 1864 as a passage to which we too much love to attach the epithet magisterial. And yet at its syntactical heart is this grotesque little hop and skip of a phrase at once unwittingly comic and vacantly malign. The gist of my argument so far is this, that the phrase, a deep dynastic wound, makes excellent sense if we take it to derive from the doctrine of original sin, a doctrine which Newman and Hopkins, in some respects Newman's protege, accepted without reservation, as did Eliot, though Yeats and Pound rejected it outright. But we are not totally committed to understanding it in that sense. It does bear other interpretations, socio-political readings, for instance. So far as English poetry and prose are involved, what I want to say is that the wound is predominantly in the grammar, by which I mean syntax and cadence, it is the same in kind for poetry and for prose, but exponentially so in the case of poetry because of the extra concentration of condensation, as it were. What is sought, I think, by all who take writing seriously, is Turing's near-perfect economy and when that fails, one is judged wanting by one's great predecessors. The dynastic connection, grammatically considered, may be represented in the syntactical relationship between main and subordinate clauses in a verse paragraph. <clears throat> 
I would cite particularly here, though I won't recite it because you all know it, I would cite particularly here the opening of the first book of Paradise Lost, in which the main affirmative clause, comprising three words only, is not heard until the first half of line six, and the matter does not end there. After a comma, the subordinate clauses take up again until the second main clause at lines 12 and 13 ends also with a comma, flowing into three further lines of adjectival and adverbial phrases until we reach the first full period at the end of line 16. The shape of the syntax in those first 16 lines of Book One of Paradise Lost, the shape of the syntax, if you will permit me the trope, is sinuous or serpentine, a form appropriate to a tragedy of deviant ethics, but appropriate also to the writhings of an agon of painful redemption. A modern analogy might be that of a radar scanner sounding out perimeters and horizons of breakdown and regeneration. Uh, Milton would certainly have understood what it is I am endeavoring to say though he might have written in the margin of my manuscript, can do better. I will here call Milton's verse syntax a dynastic syntax, because it is designed to embody and project simultaneously the hegemonies of derived rebellious power and the hierarchical grammar of salvation. But I would add to that, I call it dynastic in part because this way of considering syntax derives itself from a powerful European tradition, traceable at least to the 15th century Florentine academies and I would suspect much further back than that. Dicta, in which our human grammars, whether of obedience or rebellion, are manifestations of God's grammar. I've said elsewhere, that with done, style is faith, a measure of delivery that confesses his own inordinacy while remaining in all things ordinate. God carries us in his language, he says. God carries us in his language. Now, where at any point later than the 18th century hymnody of Isaac Watts or Charles Wesley do our poetry and prose take as a given such a sense of the mutual architectonics of cosmic pattern and divine intervention in individual destiny expressed as language? the very matter and nature of the medium in which one works. The evidence is thin. Where it exists, it does so. I mean in the later literature, it exists mainly as parody in legal fiction, a poem by the militant atheist William Empson. It exists in the prose of the profoundly Catholic writer James Joyce, and in a critical work on Joyce by the young Samuel Beckett, 
first published in 1929 before he had made any mark as a novelist and dramatist. In his essay of that year, entitled Dante Bruno Vico Joyce, writing of work in progress, as it was then called, subsequently it was called Finnegan's Wake, Beckett argues that, and I quote, here form is content, content is form. You complain that this stuff is not written in English. It is not written at all. How could we qualify this general aesthetic vigilance without which we cannot hope to snare the sense which is forever rising to the surface of the form and becoming the form itself? which is forever rising to the surface of the form and becoming the form itself. Beckett's essay is dense with citations in the Italian of Dante and Vico, which remain untranslated. There is an arrogance to Beckett in this particular mode, which I must confess I find preferable to the fawning populism of a number of our immediate contemporaries, but nonetheless, which remains a form of affectation. Setting aside such exacerbations, we must take note that although in work in progress we are told form is content, content is form, the hierarchic relation is in reverse order to that found in Dunn and in the opening verse paragraph of Paradise Lost. God carries us in his language, says Dunn. Beckett states that in Joyce, the sense is forever rising to the surface of the form and becoming the form itself the dynamic motion of a volcano rather than the descent of the dove. Those more expert than I in the literature of the English 17th century would argue that I am out of touch with history in claiming for Milton similarities to Dunn in his understanding of God's grammar. Dunn is an Anglican hierarchist. Milton, by the time of Paradise Lost, manifestly is not. It could be further argued that the dynastic movement, grammatically speaking, is much more akin in Milton to that which Beckett detects in Joyce, the sense is forever rising to the surface of the form and becoming the form itself, a movement shown at its best in passages of sublime semantic animus. This too is from book one of Paradise Lost. Jehovah, who in one night, when he passed from Egypt marching, equaled with one stroke both her firstborn and all her bleating gods. The allusion is to Exodus 11 and 12, the first Passover, Moses leading the captive Israelites out of the land of Egypt, God's slaying of the firstborn of all Egypt's sons and the firstborn of Egypt's cattle. Egypt's gods were also in the form of beasts. They're called bleating, A, because of their animality, and B, because they're ineffectual. And equal has a sense of laying low, as well as of treating equally. What I've called the animus of these lines, and book one in particular proliferates, is turbulent with numerous like examples is an energy at once etymological and rhythmic, the rhythm achieved through the masterly enjambment of grammatical clauses across the line endings. Now, a great part of the energy of Book One is the energy of anarchy, 
as Milton gives voice to the monstrous truculence of the rebel angels. The technical crisis for Milton, as for any didactic poet of his stature, is that the essential creative energy of the poet has elements within itself that are scarcely distinguishable from the saiva indignatio of those who, though ruined, yet retain, even in distorted form, some elements of their original authority. Satan, at line 98 of Book One, speaks of his own high disdain for God's ordinances. At the same time, a part of what we value as Milton's own characteristic tone, whether on behalf of the triumphant Republican cause or speaking defiance on behalf of the buried Republican cause, could also be characterized as high disdain. It may appear to you that I am here drifting to an acceptance of Blake's hypothesis in the marriage of heaven and hell, that Milton was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. But the observation as popularly understood is radically misleading. And even when the words are rightly taken, they suggest an emphasis without knowing it that fails to do justice to the poet's consciously exercised powers. Andrew Marvell's poem on Mr. Milton's Paradise Lost, prefixed to the second edition of 1674, is more to the technical point. Marvell's praise poem is a poem in heroic couplets celebrating a poem in unrhymed, that is to say, blank verse. And Marvell defends Milton's choice in Restoration England, Milton certainly needed defending by admitting that in the deep dynastic quarrel between unrhymed and rhymed poetry, he, Marvel, has aligned himself with the more trendy party. Both Marvel derivatively and Milton originally stress the inextricable conjunction of matter and style. Not only is style constrained by ethos, it asserts a reciprocally containing force, and it had better be got right. When I beheld the poet blind yet bold, in slender book his vast design unfold, Messiah crowned, God's reconciled decree, rebelling angels, the forbidden tree, heaven, hell, earth, chaos, all. The argument held me a while, misdoubting his intent, that he would ruin, for I saw him strong, the sacred truth to fable and old song. That he would ruin, for I saw him strong, the sacred truth to fable and old song. There is here a magnificent use by Marvel of that characteristic Miltonic verb, ruin. Hell saw heaven ruining from heaven. Paradise lost 6, 868. What ruins kingdoms and lays cities flat? Paradise regained 4, 363. Three implying on Marvel's part the moral anxiety that Milton might, in the joyous exercise of creative power, come to prefer the metamorphic vitality of the pagan fables, which it was his duty sub to subdue, to the unchanging word of God that he would make the urgent need to do God's work on earth as remote and irrelevant as nigh be all tears. Milton's theologico-political standpoint and Marvel's, insofar as we have any evidence for what Marvel's was, In the light of their thinking, some such initial reservations were not out of place. After all, a century after Marvel expressed them, 
and came up with that lovely word, those lovely words, old song, old song would become ossium. And an old sang incited Jacobite rebellion in both 1715 and 1745. The genius of Marvel is to make the strength of what he feared potent in that love, in the lovely cadence of that line. Milton, in his 1668 defensive note on the verse that attacked some famous modern poets, among whom he may have had to number, albeit reluctantly, Sage and Sirius Spencer, to whom he was much indebted, for having been carried away by custom to their own vexation in the trivial labyrinths of rhyme, the invention of a barbarous age. We detect in such phrasing how error itself is conceived to be dynastic, and correction is regarded as due to the inspiration of individual and courage and genius, albeit drawing upon the beneficent ancients. This neglect then of rhyme, so little is to be taken for a defect, though it may seem so perhaps to vulgar readers, that it rather is to be esteemed an example set, the first in English, of ancient liberty recovered to heroic poem from the troublesome and modern bondage of rhyming. Although Milton could scarcely have foreseen the creation early in the 18th century of a Milton dynasty in considerable part through the influence of Addison's 18 papers on Paradise Lost published in The Spectator in the early months of 1712, there is evidence that he gave thought to the survival of his moral political legacy. See Sharon Achenstein's pamphlet, Citizen Milton, published by the Bodleian Library for the 2008 Quater Centenary. In his Latin ode of 1647 to John Rouse, Bodley's librarian, Milton writes, admittedly in a sequence of commonplaces, but perhaps our remote descendants and an age of greater wisdom and purer heart will render fairer judgment on all things. Then, thanks to Rouse, with envy in the tomb, a saner posterity will know if any merit is mine. In the matter of post-restoration censorship, this university's record is poor, though the reputation of the Bodleian shines. Milton's books were twice, in 1660 and 1683, condemned to be publicly burned as treasonous and subversive matter. In 1660, the Bodleian squirreled them away, and they survived as they survived also the later assault on writings condemned as being destructive of the kingly government. Addison, in 1712, presented Milton largely as a treasure house of heroic beauties and moral apothegms. He says, we were told in the foregoing book how the evil spirit practiced upon Eve as she lay asleep in order to inspire her with thoughts of vanity, pride, and ambition. Or again, Milton everywhere fills his poem with circumstances that are marvellous and astonishing. Addison establishes Milton's preeminence as a poet by neutering his political and theological radicalism. Because of late 17th century orthographical and typographical conventions, such as capitalizing the first letter of nouns, in reading these very early defenses of Milton by people like John Toland and, and his nephew uh, Phillips, you, you think you might be reading German. Uh, a language, say, in which you know a fair number of abstract nouns, 
but where the conditionals of verbs and other grammatical nuances mostly escape you. And it, it, it may be that the relapse into capital virtues and broad general appeals to the judicious reader, which one notices throughout 18th century poetry presentations, derives in part from attempts to make the Milton inheritance acceptable to a posterity in which anti-Commonwealth animus was strong. That is why one senses the particular satisfaction in Samuel Johnson's voice, that sense of swimming against the stream of cultural platitude, when he refers to Milton as an acrimonious and surly Republican, thereby rendering the poet much more of his honest due than he had received from the earlier cornered, temporizing partisans, pioneers of the 18th, 19th century Miltonic critical dynasty. When Martin J. Svalic, annotating his major edition, his magisterial edition, of Newman's Apologia Pro Vita Sua, writes of its second edition, 1865, as having been developed into the clearer, more vivid and dramatic story of a still more appealing human being. He is imitating, though not as far as I can tell, parodying the voice of the judicious reader. The judicious reader always prefers the still more appealing human being to the threatening device of the poem itself. So that over the years, more and more poems come to be written for the judicious reader, who can even be taught in time that words like fuck are part of the inoffensive appeal. The judicious reader copes less well, perhaps, with lines such as your spun farm's root still on that axis dwells, as Riding and Graves noted in 1927, a year before Emerson composed legal fiction. The poet has committed the unforgivable modernist sin of allowing the audience to have more than one possible reaction to a single poem. They were referring not to Emerson, but to a poem, Captain Carpenter, by the American poet John Crow Ransom. Ransom, who had served as a first lieutenant of field artillery with the American Expeditionary Force in France in 1918, admired Robert Graves, who reciprocated the respect writing an introduction to Ransom's first English collection, Grace After Meat, 1924, which was in fact dedicated to graves, if you follow me. The quality that caught Graves' attention in Ransom's work was, and I quote, an extremely fastidious art disguised by colloquialisms and a pretense of every which way. Rather to my belated surprise, Graves is becoming something of a key figure in this series of lectures. Rather to my belated surprise. Incessant self-education is one of the recurring pleasures of my kind of work. His cruciality, Graves' cruciality, I now see is due to two conjoined factors, craft and trauma, craft and trauma. Graves served in the trenches, was once reported in the press as having died of wounds, was demobilized with shell shock, PTSD. And I think the fact that Ransom had fought in France 
would have been for Graves a subjective enhancement of an objective appraisal and appreciation. I think it's fair to say that. Two of Graves' early prose books on English poetry, 1922, and Poetic Unreason and Other Studies, 1925, I would certainly recommend as required reading for autodidactic, self-apprenticed, deeply eccentric young poets. Though there has been much quarrelling over the matter, I think there can be no doubt that Graves' suggestions in the three pages entitled Conflict of Emotions in the book on English Poetry anticipated Empson's method in Seven Types of Ambiguity, 1930, by almost a decade. I call Graves a crucial figure. That is because his work constitutes a crux, a crux of techne with mental and emotional crisis. When you have techne without crisis, the result is poetry similar to that written by the movement poets of the 1950s, John Wayne, John Holloway and others. Donald Davy, I think, was the best of these dogmatists, Larkin somewhat of a presiding genius, as of course was Empson. Wayne claimed with some justice that his essay, Ambiguous Gifts, in Penguin New Writing, Volume 14, 1950, had established Empson's presidential status in the immediate post-war years. Crisis without a sound grasp of, or a naive indifference to techne, inspired works such as that of Margot Ruddock, briefly Yeats's protégé. On the matter of poetry and dynasty, I believe that the matter resolves itself into two main clauses. A, poets who have a sense of their own worth are nonetheless pleased to derive their virtues from their ancestry. Yeats, the Eliot of tradition and the individual talent and of after strange gods. Uh, the self-named fugitive poets of the American 1930s uh, John Crow Ransom, Alan Tate, Robert Penn Warren being the best known, or being once the best known. B, poets who have an alarming tendency to wish to establish dynasties. Yeats again in such major poems of the 1920s as A Prayer for My Daughter and Meditations in Time of Civil War and in his lunatic anthology of the mid-30s, the Oxford Book of Modern Verse. Lunatic, in that it gave 15 pages to Dorothy Wellesley, Lady Gerald Wellesley, and 16 to Walter James Turner, and 11 to Oliver Sinjin Gogati. It gave 12 to Eliot, while omitting Wilfred Owen entirely on the grounds that he was evidently a revered sandwich-board man of the revolution. My title, A Deep Dynastic Wound, is taken from a poem by John Crow Ransom, Dead Boy. The little cousin is dead by foul subtraction, a green bough from Virginia's aged tree. And neither the county kin love the transaction, nor some of the world of outer dark like me. He was not a beautiful boy, nor good, nor clever, a black cloud full of storms, too hot for keeping, a sword beneath his mother's heart. Yet never woman bewept her babe as this is weeping. A pig with a pasty face, I had always said, squealing for cookies, kinned by pure pretense with a noble house. But the little man quite dead. I can see the forebear's antique lineaments. The elder men have strode by the box of death to the wide flagged porch 
and muttering low send round the bruit of the day. O oh, friendly waste of breath, their hearts are hurt with a deep dynastic wound. He was pale and little, the foolish neighbours say. The first fruits, saith the preacher, the Lord hath taken. But this was the old tree's late branch wrenched away, aggrieving the sapless limbs, the shore and shaken. Between the first edition and the selected poems of 1945, Ransom made numerous small verbal changes. Too many to give in detail here. But I would say generally that they are all what I would call Gravesian changes though Graves preferred such changes to be made in the form of pre-publication, preliminary and final drafts. Uh, see section 25, putty, putty, and 44, surface faults in illustration in the book on English poetry of 1922, and the chapter, secondary elaboration in poetic unreason of 1925, The pitch that Ransom chooses, both initially and by those minute changes, is well caught in Graves' words of commendation. We find an extremely fastidious art, disguised by colloquialisms and a pretense of every which way. I tried, tried to bring that out in my reading of his phrases, and also the beautiful cadence of those lines. Uh, Ransom is a great master of what, call, what Pound called melopoeia, the melody, and what I call the cadence uh, of lines. Ransom taught Alan Tate at Vanderbilt, and Tate, albeit informally and somewhat to his alarm, taught Robert Lowell. The young poet was a self-invited house guest. On arriving at the house, he was told, well, I don't think there's any room in the house. It's full, so he pitched a pup tent on the front lawn. Um, Tate also wrote the introduction to Robert Lowell's first collection, Land of Unlikeness, 1944, in which he concluded, this is Tate, the history of poetry shows that good verse does not inevitably make its way. The history of poetry shows that good verse does not inevitably make its way. But unless after the war, the small public for poetry shall exclude all except the democratic poets who enthusiastically greet the advent of the slave society, Robert Lowell will have to be reckoned with. Christopher Dawson has shown in long historical perspective that material progress may mask social and spiritual decay. But the spiritual decay is not universal, and in a young man like Lowell, whether we like his Catholicism or not, there is at least a memory of the spiritual dignity of man, now sacrificed to mere secularization and a craving for mechanical order. Hmm, you will say, sounds a bit like Hill. 
By the advent of the slave society, Tate means post-1944 secularization and the craving for mechanical order, or what the Anglo-French writer Hilaire Belloc had termed the servile state. And the good-natured reader says, hold on. The slave society in the USA existed in the pre-1865 South. And in 1944, the year of this diatribe, the American armed services are segregated. And in the South, in 1944, and for at least 20 years after, blacks cannot eat in public with whites, and blacks are required to give up their seats on public transport. There is something very crudely dynastic going on here in Tate's argument. And without the reserves of appraisal that Ransom can write into the dynastic lamentation of his poem, Dead Boy, through the superb handling of Melopea and the weighing of phrase and of clause. I said that the Lowell book which Tate introduces there uh, was his first. It was a Cummington Press book. The Cummington Press publications were fine press, limited runs. Land of Unlikeness ran to 250 copies, of which, and I quote the printer's colophon, of which 26 are on Dacian paper, numbered and signed by the author. The most recent copy on offer, and that was quite recently, was priced at 1,200 pounds. Such editions are cenacle offerings. There is in Tate's introduction a distinct sense of dynastic tradition and inheritance all the more strongly implied in his introduction, because the next generation has arrived, and arrived in the form of young Cal Lowell, an apostate Puritan, the scion of one of New England's oldest and most distinguished families. Now, the fugitive group attitudes, and as I say, the fugitive group are Tate, Pro Ransom, Robert Penn Warren, and several others. Um, the fugitive group attitudes are directly cited and applauded in the opening paragraphs of T.S. Eliot's After Strange Gods, based on lectures given in 1933 at the University of Virginia. And I quote a short passage. But I think a characteristic passage. I think, he says, I think that the chances for the re-establishment of a native culture are perhaps better here than in New England. You're farther away from New York. You have been less industrialized and less invaded by foreign races. And you have a more opulent soil. This is a dynastic rhetoric with which the young Robert Lowell felt privileged to be associated, and I could well understand why. It had created some excellent modernist poetry with a strong emphasis on oratorical structure. Alan Tate's Ode to the Confederate Dead is, in my estimation, a masterpiece of modernist oratory, 
and Ransom and Tate were charismatic teachers. Lord Weiris Castle, 1946, Lowell's second book, produced largely under Tate's aegis, is one of the finest verse collections since the work of Yeats's final decade. Now, by the time of the book For the Union Dead, 19 years later, Lowell is aware that the legacy is compromised, tainted even. The title poem of this 1965 collection of Lowell's is, of course, an example of the apprentice striving to kill the master. For the Union Dead is an obvious Meistersinger challenge to Tate's own masterly Ode to, the, Ode to the Confederate Dead of some 20 years previously. Now Lowell's topos in For the Union Dead is the St. Gordon's bronze relief sculpture outside the State House on Boston Common erected in memory of the 54th Massachusetts, a black regiment with white officers led by Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who died together with many of the black rank and file in the assault on Fort Wagner in July 1863, and was tossed with them into an unmarked mass grave on the site. Here are just two stanzas from Lowell's For the Union Dead. The stone statues of the abstract Union soldier grow slimmer and younger each year. Wasp wasted, they doze over muskets and muse through their sideburns. Shaw's father wanted no monument except the ditch where his son's body was thrown and lost with his niggers. That last word in the text is carefully encased in double inverted commas. And I recall a BBC tape of Lowell at a public reading sometime in the early or mid 70s, he died in 77, in which he breaks off the recitation of the poem to interpolate the explanation that the word was not his responsibility, but is a quotation from a remark made by Shaw's father when asked where he wished his son's body to lie. Now Lowell's voice in, in breaking, breaking off the reading of the poem to interpolate this explanation. His voice, as I recall it, I mean, it, over a considerable number of years, is nervous and staccato and strained. I began by alluding to the doctrine of original sin, and it appears that I must also terminate with that doctrine. The work of Alan Tate, to judge from my inquiries, has been virtually erased from the reconstructed liberal pedagogic memory in the States. I say the issue is complex. It's complex with Tate, as is the case with the anti-Semite Ezra Pound. Pound the fascist, the vicious slanderer of Jews, is a great poet and the greatest benefactor to poetry in the 20th century. And Tate, the pained Confederate elegist, is at his best, as in this ode, a minor poet of most impressive powers. 
both things are true. I have said this before. You cannot melt the one into the other, whichever way you want the melting to take place. The two facts stand affronting each other, and I believe that in all honesty one must allow this mutual affrontation to exist. Reading the other day Susan Brigden's recently published book on the life and work of the Henrician court poet Thomas Wyatt, my eye was caught by a citation from Juan Luis Vives, compatriot and counsellor to Henry VIII's first wife, and some would say only true wife, Catherine of Aragon. Vives says, the words proper to poetry are lofty, sublime, brilliant, but fatal faults are mixed with them. The words proper to poetry are lofty, sublime, brilliant, but fatal faults are mixed with them. It's a partial view. Terms such as lofty, sublime, brilliant touch on only one aspect of poetic achievement, and that a narrow one. Yet as a reminder of the innate and intrinsic flaw in creative endeavor, it is timely. The deep dynastic wound is neither exclusively ethical nor exclusively structural. It may effectively be conceived of as perennially embedded in the very nature of human grammar itself, constituent with those elements that are drawn on in the highest achievement of the verbal arts. Thank you. Thank you.